Okay guys, very good morning. Welcome to the briefing then for Friday the 16th of September. Uh, right on cue, winter begins, we all get soaked this morning. So I hope you had a pleasant journey in. Onwards and upwards. Looking at the, uh, the state of play of the financial markets at the moment, there's a couple of quite interesting things uh, to talk about this morning. Um, first of which is, you know, yesterday was a, an awfully tricky day to, to trade because the data that we had, as we uh, were experiencing yesterday, we had a data dump from the US, so to speak, and we had conflicting signals because the retail sales report was weak but likes of Philly Fed manufacturing index actually came in headline reading at the highest level since or in 18 months. Uh, and eventually after seesawing price action around the actual release, uh, the market's actually powered uh, quite aggressively higher. And when you're looking in the context of the last, well, four sessions, you've had some really, you know, compared to the very narrow trading ranges that we had during the summer period, you've had four real consecutive days of sizable price action. In fact, actually, the S&P has moved 1% or more in either direction for four consecutive days. If it does it again today, so the S&P has not moved more than 1% either direction, alternating, it hasn't done five consecutive days for over 80 years. You know, so when, you, when you're kind of thinking about if you're finding it difficult to trade these market conditions, then volatility wise, in terms of the price swings that you're seeing and the spoos at the moment, these are fairly unprecedented. Again, you have to go back a fair while since we last saw such back to back to back to back large moves. Um, one index actually to, to share with you that's been quite interesting is that so this is the well, let me get the this is the chart I wanted to show you so this is the Nasdaq I've got at the top and this is the S&P I've got at the bottom you can see here in terms of the S&P this was when Rosengren spoke well it was this time last week on Friday and it was around this level where he made his comments that was the catalyst for the big sell-off now looking where we are from the range that we trained in from that point to the low, we are pretty much banging on in the middle of that range. However, if you look at the NASDAQ, now this is when Rosengren spoke in terms of where the NASDAQ was priced at the time. That was around this point. That was the low that we saw on the back of the comments and then through to Monday. And look where the NASDAQ is trading now. The NASDAQ, you know, comparatively the S&P is mid-range. The NASDAQ is over and above where we were trading when Rosengren was. Now, one of the predominant reasons for this has been the performance of, well, you know my feelings probably by now, what I think about Apple nonetheless. Don't know why I do it to myself, but I've bought the new phone. Can't get away from it now. Too scared to move to Samsung. But, you know, everyone, you had a lot of large scale investors bailing out of Apple only a few months ago. I think it was Warren Buffett actually was one that stepped in and actually purchased, uh, increased his stake. Well, you know, Warren Buffett is not a multi, multi billionaire for no reason. Apple's stock has rallied 11% in four days. Now, looking at that in graphic terms, in terms of seeing it on a chart, this is Apple's biggest four day rally they've seen since 2014. The stock individually has added $60 billion in four days. And when you start looking over a quarter period, Apple's poised for its best quarter versus the S&P in four years. They rallied over 20%. So just when you thought the lack of innovation, they're down and out, it's the beginning of the end, boom, they rally like that. And this is important. The reason I'm pointing this out is because this is why you need to know your individual stocks and their index weighting. Because Apple, as you know, one of the largest companies in the world, when they move by a significant margin, it has the propensity to carry the index with it and also the related sectors. You know, if Apple's doing well, there's also a huge supply chain globally 
um, predominantly in Asia, that also gets lifted on the back of that strong demand we've seen, which has been surprising for the new iPhone 7. Now, there was a headline yesterday. I know one of the guys here was asking me about a blip we saw in the DAX yesterday morning. So out of nowhere, the DAX spiked. And that was because there was some individual single stock news for Siemens. And Siemens, of course, one of the largest companies in the DAX. And they actually made a comment that they are thinking about upgrading their full year earnings forecast. Now, when you think about this present situation or economic environment of uncertainty, when you have a company going against the trend, if you like, of generally people being more downbeat about the future, they're saying they're going to up their earnings forecasts. Immediately their shares spike and the DAX sees a, a, a momentary blip higher as well. So, you know, even if you're trading the, the index future, you need to be mindful of who are the major components that make up that index. It's an, it's an important part of the, the jigsaw puzzle, if you like, if you're going to be a successful stocks trader. Let me just put my charts. Just moving my charts back here. Moving on, obviously the Fed and you know where do we go from here on expectations for September. Uh, this is kind of you know the thing I'm, I'm finding it struggling with at the moment is that you know when Piers was on CNBC probably around four weeks ago he was talking about the fact the fact that the Fed should act. He doesn't think that they will. And we still seem to be stuck in that limbo probably four weeks after that comment that he made. Because even in spite of all the communication the Fed have made, all the economic data we've seen, ultimately the market still seems a little bit undecided on, on fully uh, having confidence in either decision, whether to increase rates or holds next week. Well, a couple of uh, graphics to show with you. Uh, and it's the changing view of which essentially the market has had over uh, recent times. So this is the Bloomberg survey that they do of general market participants. Uh, you can see they've conducted surveys at the end of December, March, June, uh, and more recently, September. Uh, what you can see then is that at the moment, the latest survey would suggest then that people have, have more so discounted a near-term hike and their expectations are increasing that December is now seen as the most viable option. Remember back in December 2015 of course that was when the Fed actually lifted rates and they were communicating to us that this potentially could have been the start uh, of a cycle of normalization i.e. incremental increases in interest rates. So at that point we we're actually thinking that yeah, September, 90% probability we'd see a rate hike in September of the next year. But as, as well as you and I know now, that's more like 10% in federal funds rate futures. And then obviously this leads to that discussion on actually, you know, is that a mispricing? Is the market being too complacent? Well, you know, time will tell. We've only got a few more days really until we'll find out from the Fed themselves. But that does lead us nicely on to the next chart. So when you're trying to decipher fundamental news, uh, you've heard this, or you've heard us use this terminology before about uh, a kind of dovish hold or a hawkish hike and so on. So what do these, you know, what do these words actually mean? Well, this graphic's uh, quite a simple way to look at it. So if the Fed hike rates at the September meeting, that's on the left-hand side. If the Fed does not hike next week, that's on the right-hand side. Now, the key here is about forward guidance and how strong the Fed will communicate the language on hiking in the future. Now, if the Fed pulls the trigger, they're going to have to deliver by hiking rates. That's a hawkish move. And so by default, what they're going to actually need to do is communicate dovishly thereafter in the projections, possibly, and Janet Yellen, because the market is not priced for the hike uh, at this point. So if it occurs, you'll have an immediate hawkish reaction, dollar strength, uh, equities would probably come under pressure and so on and so forth. So then they'll need to temper the market's volatility by sounding quite dovish that, hang about, this is going to be a very slow return of normalization of policy. Now, if, they, if the Fed doesn't hike in September, it needs to re maintain its credibility. And by that, what I mean is, although it might hold, which is a more dovish scenario, 
they might be it might be a more hawkish hold if that makes sense so they have to communicate that even though we've not hiked rates now we will hike rates in the future if the economy continues on track and data dependent so on and so forth and so that they keep december alive let's not forget the fed started this year anticipating four interest rate hikes they do not want to go the entire year with doing zero because that's only going to probably do harm towards the market's confidence in actually that the Fed can deliver on their promises. So that hopefully puts it in a bit more context. Obviously, it's a big thing for next week. A uh, quick look back at the charts and looking at the DAX index this morning. Uh, just bear with me one second. It's like my computer's having a, a bit of a Friday snooze at the moment. So while the charts load up, there was a big story this morning regarding Deutsche Bank. Now, let me just highlight here, that was the close that we had last night. Remember, equities generally were rallying into the close last night. All major three indices in the US finished up around a percent. Outperformance in the NASDAQ finished up 1.5%. That was a positive tone for Asia overnight. Following the US's lead, volumes overnight were fairly light because there's a various holidays going on in Asia at the moment. China, Hong Kong are out for their autumn moon festival. So futures closed up at around their best levels. I'm talking European futures at 9 p.m. We've then gapped lower quite aggressively this morning. And actually, we've had a, a downward trend since the market opened. A bit of volatility, obviously, around the cash open. But net-net, the DAX is, is down uh, fairly significantly this morning. So the reason for that is Deutsche Bank. You know, we were talking about regulation and compliance and so on earlier this week. And a lecture I shared with you guys on the mic. And quite interesting on the timing then, yesterday, of course, was the eight-year anniversary of the Chapter 11 bankruptcy filing of Lehman Brothers, i.e. the height, the catalyst, or the ignition of the financial crisis. Well, Deutsche Bank's just been fined $14.14 billion over mortgage claims related to the financial crisis. That $14 billion is three times more than what analysts were expecting. Deutsche Bank shares this morning down 8%. So again, Deutsche Bank's not one of the largest index or, or market weighted stocks within the DAX. However, what this does signal is it can uh, create uncertainty around the sector. And as you know from the Italian <coughs> bank stock fluctuations and volatility that you see, bank stocks are the most highest sensitive, I'd say, uh, to just general news flow. And with this situation, what it can do is weigh on other banks in the fear that there's also large-scale litigation of record numbers to come potentially for other banks. And therefore, you get some uh, a pressure feed through. At this point, Deutsche Bank, just to stress, have said that there's no way they're going to pay that amount and that this is just the beginning of the negotiation period with the Department of Justice in the US. Um, but it's the shock and awe to the market that prompts this kind of gap lower. Don't forget this news actually came out last night. So their ADRs, which is their US listed shares, actually fell in aftermarket hours yesterday. That then means that as soon as you get in, you know that already if the ADRs have moved, then they're gonna gap lower at the open it's just by how much that's when someone like me will be talking to brokers to try and get an opening call of which i delivered to you guys ahead of the cash open uh, i know for one our guys ben and vast traded that dax move on the back of that fundamental news so that's how you kind of take advantage of of that news flow and timing uh, let me just show think let me switch over this was the DAX move that I was just showing you here that was the, the close last night that was the gap lower and then here we are in the futures this morning down predominantly on the back of that news uh, a quick look elsewhere let's move on to oil prices uh, just want to talk about this actually in a bit more of a broader context really uh, looking at the week as a whole or certainly since last Friday uh, remember holiday shortened week that we had 
last week meant that the DOE crude oil inventories came out on a Thursday. Uh, this was that monumental drawdown that we had, the second largest on record. That caused a spike higher in prices where we peaked at around 47.75. Since that point, though, we have been on what, more broadly speaking, is a fairly consistent downward trend. We've actually fallen from that high around 9.5%. We've had some volatility on the way, but generally speaking, definitely uh, from where we were at the end of last week, we are considerably lower in crude oil prices. Well, a couple of things to talk about here. The IEA was a very significant report that we had earlier this week where they stated that they've basically revised their forecast. Not only are they seeing uh, weaker demand, but more importantly, they've said that the surplus of crude oil is going to take longer to diminish. And that's going to be a negative uh, impact on prices over the near term and medium term horizon. In addition, you've also got the likes of returning supply from Libya and Nigeria, which will hamper a rebalancing of the global crude market and weighing on sentiment. And so there's a couple of different things at play here uh, in the energy markets. And then one number which comes out in the evening is the US Baker Hughes rig count. Now, let me just share with you a graphic here. So this graphic I'm showing you here is the Baker Hughes rig count. And as you know, uh, if you've been following the news that I, that I tweet, I put in our Facebook group because this comes out in the evening on a Friday. But the rig count's been going up at a fairly consistent and stable pace. Actually, 414 was the print that we had on Friday. And that puts us at the highest level since... 19th of February. So actually, the operational rig counts in the US are at their highest level since February. And if you remember in February, in WTI crude prices, well, let's just have a quick look. You remember what we were trading at that point in time? Uh, well, let me go back. This was when? That's January. That's February. Can you see that? That was when we were trading the low, 2608, 2607. So at that point, that's when oil was particularly low as Saudi was having this big fight trying to kill the shale industry and so on. Volatility over China uh, caused people to rethink global economic growth, slowing, hard landing, so on. And rig counts fell quite dramatically. But we're back up now to those levels that were seen when oil prices were in fact trading at their lows of 2016. So quite an interesting development that's just happening in the backdrop in a larger context, I'd say, of crude oil prices at the moment. Okay, moving on. Let's just have a quick look at the calendar for today. Uh, moving my screen. This morning is actually very quiet, but one thing I would like to point out is this. If you can read that, okay. So today is quadruple witching. Let me just quickly flash up a, an explanation here. This is the most simplest explanation you, that you can find. So quadruple witching, important for stock traders. It refers to the third Friday of each month, or every quarter, I should say, March, June, Sep, and December. And on these days, this is the important part, market index futures, market index options, stock options, and stock futures all expire. Now, this, generally speaking, then, means that people have to come out of those contracts before expiration. They generally buy into, roll it over to the next contract. What it means is that you get a lot of flurry of price activity just before the contract expires. And so if you are trading uh, it's the futures, you've just got to be a little bit careful on a day like today. Uh, let me just show you here. So these are the actual timings here. So as a stocks trader, I would definitely have all of these times written down on my notepad, especially for if you are trading these particular products. So you've got the FTSE 100 future at 10.15, the Eurostox at 11 a.m., the DAX at midday, and the CAC is not until later on. You've also then got the US as well at the open. 
So typically what you might see at midday when the DAC SEP contract expires and then we roll over to DEC, the SEP contract will see uh, a large amount of volatility just before. So don't get caught out by that. Uh, let me just show you that definition again. So here's what I'm looking at. Market index futures, market index options, stock options and stock futures all expiring. And most importantly, it results in increased volatility most typically. So just be that's just a note for specifically today and going forward quarterly basis. Going back to the calendar then, very quiet for economic data this morning, not too much of note. Uh, later though, we get more US data of significance. First up will be US CPI. And obviously when you're looking at US CPI, showing you here the month on month readings that we've had of late, it's been fairly benign. And if you remember, like all central banks, the Fed, just like others, has an inflation target of which they're falling far short of at the moment. So it'd be interesting to see how, they, how this data comes out in the afternoon. And then later we have University of Michigan sentiment. Now, as you know, the P stands for preliminary. So this is the first look we get of the September report of Michigan. That means it's the more important one of the two that comes out on a monthly basis. Uh, looking at the data here, the last two months have been fairly consistent. Um, however, the last reading was just by a fraction 0.2, the lowest reading since April. And again, the reason why these data points have become uh, more important at this given point in time is because the market is trying to get a signal as to Fed thinking. Going back to the Canada, just to wrap things up, one other, one other event which I think you need to watch closely is this one at 10.30 a.m. If you're trading cable, then you definitely need to be aware of this event because Christine Forbes, if you remember rightly from the minutes yesterday, it was her and McCafferty who said that they were basically unhappy with the re restarting of QE, i.e. they erred on the more hawkish side comparative to the rest of the board. Therefore, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what she has to say, if she has anything to add on what the Bank of England did with that multiple package that they delivered of easing in August. Uh, in fact, just taking a look at cable this morning, uh, the dollar's a little bit stronger. Dollar index is up around 0.1%. Uh, bit of downward pressure seen on cable this morning. Uh, I guess probably eyeing next up You've got that uh, S1 sitting just six pips above the low print that was seen from yesterday, which also coincides with the psychological 132 handle. Uh, okay, guys, going to wrap it up with that. Thanks for listening. Enjoy your session. And have a good weekend if I don't speak to you before then. Thanks.